Dylan Bullcutter and the Moon Child, based on an old Japanese folk tale. Long, long ago, there lived an old bamboo woodcutter. He was very poor and sad also, for no child had heaven sent to cheer his old age, and in his heart there was no hope of rest from work till he died and was laid in the quiet grave. Every morning, he went forth into the woods and hills, wherever the bamboo reared its little green plumes against the sky. When he had made his choice, he would cut down these feathers of the forest, and splitting them lengthwise or cutting them into joints, would carry the bamboo wood home and make it into various articles for the household. And he and his old wife gained a small livelihood by selling them. One morning, as usual, he had gone out to his work, and having found a nice clump of bamboos, had set to work to cut some of them down. Suddenly, the green grove of bamboos was flooded with a bright soft light, as if the full moon had risen over the spot. Looking around in astonishment, he saw that the brilliance was streaming from one bamboo. The old man, full of wonder, dropped his axe and went towards the light. On nearer approach, he saw that the soft splendor came from a hollow in the green bamboo stem, and still, more wonderful to behold, in the midst of the brilliance stood a tiny human being, only three inches in height and exquisitely beautiful in appearance. You must be sent to be my child, for I find you here among the bamboos, where lies my daily work, said the old man, and taking the little creature in his hands, he took it home to his wife to bring it up. The tiny girl was so exceedingly beautiful and so small that the old man put her into a basket to safeguard her from the least possibility of being hurt in any way. From this time on, the old man often found gold in the notches of the bamboos when he hewed them down and cut them up. Not only gold, but precious stones also, so that by degrees he became rich. He built himself a fine house and was no longer known as a poor bamboo woodcutter, but as a wealthy man. Three months passed quickly away, and in that time the bamboo girl had, wonderful to say, become a full-grown girl. So, her foster parents did up her hair and dressed her in beautiful kimonos. She was of such wondrous beauty that they placed her behind the screens like a princess and allowed no one to see her, waiting upon her themselves. It seemed as if she were made of light, for the house was filled with soft shining, so that even in the dark of night it was like daytime. Her presence seemed to have a bending influence on those there. Whenever the old man felt sad, he only had to look upon his foster daughter, and his sorrow vanished, and he became as happy as when he was a youth. At last the day came for the naming of their newfound child. So the old couple called in a celebrated name-giver, and he gave her the name of Princess Moonlight, because her body gave forth so much soft, bright light that she might have been a daughter of the moon god. For three days, the festival was kept up with song and dance and music. All the friends and relations of the old couple were present, and great was their enjoyment of the festivities held to celebrate the naming of Princess Moonlight. Everyone who saw her declared that there never had been seen anyone so lovely. All the beauties throughout the length and breadth of the land would grow pale besides her. So they said. The fame of the princess's loveliness spread far and wide, and many were the suitors who desired to win her hand, or even so much as to see her. Suitors from far and near posted themselves outside the house and made little holes in the fence in the hope of catching a glimpse of the princess as she went from one room to the other along the veranda. They stayed there day and night, sacrificing even their sleep for a chance of seeing her, but all in vain. Then they approached the house and tried to speak to the old man and his wife, or some of the servants, but not even this was granted them. Still, in spite of all this disappointment, they stayed on day after day and night after night, and counted it as nothing 
so great was their desire to see the princess. At last, however, most of the men, seeing how hopeless their quest was, lost heart and hope for both, and returned to their homes, all except five knights, whose ardor and determination, instead of warning, seemed to wax greater with obstacles. These five men even went without their meals and took snatches of whatever they could get brought to them, so that they might always stand outside the dwelling. They stood there in all weathers, in sunshine and in rain. Sometimes they wrote letters to the princess, but no answer was returned to them. Then, when letters failed to draw any reply, they wrote poems to tell her of the hopeless love which kept them from sleep, from food, from rest, and even from their homes. Still, Princess Moonlight gave no sign of having received their verses. In this hopeless state, the winter passed. The snow and frost and the cold winds gradually gave place to the gentle warmth of spring. Then the summer came, and the sun burned white and scorching in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And still, these faithful knights kept watch and waited. At the end of these long months, they called out to the bamboo cutter and entreated him to have some mercy upon them and to show them the princess. But he answered only that as he was not her real father, he could not insist on her obeying him against her wishes. The five knights, on receiving this stern answer, returned to their several homes and pondered over the best means of touching the proud princess's heart, even so much as to grant them a hearing. They took their rosaries in hands and knelt before their household shrines and burned precious incense, praying to Buddha to give them their heart's desire. Thus, several days passed, but even so, they could not rest in their homes. So again they set out for the bamboo cutter's house. This time the old man came out to see them, and they asked him to let them know if it was the princess's resolution never to see any man whatsoever. And they implored him to speak for them and to tell her the greatness of their love, and how long they had waited through the cold of winter and the heat of summer, sleepless and roofless through all weathers without food and without rest in the ardent hope of winning her, and they were willing to consider this long vigil as pleasure if she would but give them one chance of pleading their cause with her. The old man lent a willing ear to their tale of love, for in his inmost heart he felt sorry for these faithful suitors and would have liked to see his lovely foster daughter married to one of them. So he went to Princess Moonlight and said reverently, Although you have always seemed to me to be a heavenly being, yet I have always had the trouble of bringing you up as my own child, and you have been glad of the protection of my roof. Will you refuse to do as I wish? Then Princess Moonlight replied that there was nothing she would not do for him, that she honored and loved him as her own father, and that as for herself she could not remember the time before she came to earth. The old man listened with great joy as she spoke these dutiful words. Then he told her how anxious he was to see her safely and happily married before he died. I am an old man, over seventy years of age, and my end may come any time now. It is necessary and right that you should see these five suitors and choose one of them. Oh, why? said the princess in distress. Why must I do this? I have no wish to marry now. I found you, answered the old man, many years ago, when you were a little creature three inches in height, in the midst of a great white light. The light streamed from one bamboo in which you were hid and led me to you. So I have always thought that you were more than a mortal woman. While I am alive, it is right for you to remain as you are if you wish to do so. But some day I shall cease to be, and who will take care of you then? Therefore, I pray you to meet these five brave men, one at a time, and make up your mind to marry one of them. Then the princess answered that she felt sure 
that she was not as beautiful as perhaps reports made her out to be, and that even if she consented to marry any one of them, not really knowing her before, his heart might change afterwards. So as she did not feel sure of them, even though her father told her they were worthy knights, she did not feel it wise to see them. All you say is very reasonable, said the old man, but what kind of men will you consent to see? I do not call these five men, who have waited on you for months, light-hearted. They have stood outside his house through the winter and the summer, often denying themselves food and sleep so that they may win you. What more can you demand? Then, Princess Moonlight said, she must make further trial of their love before she would grant a request to interview her. The five warriors were to prove their love by each bringing her from distant countries something that she desired to possess. That same evening, the suitors arrived and began to play their flutes and in turn sing their self-composed songs, telling of their great and tireless love. The bamboo cutter went out to them and offered them his sympathies for all they had endured and all the patience they had shown and their desire to win his foster daughter. Then he gave them her message, that she would consent to marry whoever was successful in bringing her what she wanted. This was a test to them. The five all accepted the trial and thought it an excellent plan, for it would prevent jealousy between them. Princess Moonlight then sent word to the first knight, and she requested him to bring her the stone bowl, which had belonged to Buddha in India. The second knight was asked to go to the mountain of Horai, said to be situated in the eastern sea, and to bring her a branch of the wonderful tree that grew on its summit. The roots of this tree were of silver, the trunk of gold, and the branches bore its fruit white jewels. The third knight was told to go to China and search for the fire red and to bring her its skin. The fourth knight was told to search for the dragon that carried on its head the stone radiating five colors and to bring the stone to her. The fifth knight was to find the swallow which carried a shell in its stomach and to bring the shell to her. The old man taught these very hard tasks and hesitated to carry the messages. But the princess would make no other conditions. So her commands were issued, word for word, to the five men who, when they heard what was requested of them, were all disheartened and disgusted at what seems to them the impossibility of the tasks given to them, and they returned to their own homes in despair. But after a time, when they thought of the princess, the love in their hearts revived for her, and they resolved to make an attempt to get what she desired of them. The first knight sent word to the princess that he was starting out that day on the quest of Buddha's bowl, and he hoped soon to bring it to her, but he had not the courage to go all the way to India, for in those days traveling was very difficult and full of danger. So he went to one of the temples in Kyoto and took a stone ball from the altar there. Paying the priest a large sum of money for it, he then wrapped it in a cloth of gold and waited quietly for three years, returned and carried it to the old man. Princess Moonlight wondered how the knights had returned so soon. She took the ball from its gold wrapping expecting it to make the room full of light, but it did not shine at all, so she knew that it was a scam thing, and not the true bowl of Buddha. She returned it at once and refused to see him. The knight threw the bowl away and returned to his home in despair. He gave up all hopes of ever winning the princess. The second knight told his parents that he needed change of air for his health, for he was ashamed to tell them that love for the princess was the real cause of his leaving them. He then left his home, at the same time sending words to the princess that he was setting out for Mount Horai 
in the hope of getting her a branch of the gold and silver tree. He only allowed his servants to accompany him halfway and then sent them back. He reached the seashore and embarked on a small ship, and after sailing away for three days, he landed and employed several carpenters to build him a house contrived in such a way that no one could get access to it. He then shut himself up with six skilled jewelers and endeavored to make such a golden and silver branch as he thought would satisfy the princess as having come from the wonderful tree growing on Mount Hore. Everyone whom he had asked declared that Mount Hore belonged to the land of fable and not of fact. When the branch was finished, he took his journey home and tried to make himself look as if he were worried and worn out to travel. He put the jeweled branch into a lacquer box and carried it to the bamboo cutter, begging him to present it to the princess. The old man was quite deceived by the travel-stained appearance of the night and thought that he had only just returned from his long journey with the branch. So he tried to persuade the princess to see the man, but she remained silent and looked very sad. The old man began to take out the branch and praise it as a wonderful treasure to be found nowhere in the whole land. Then he spoke of the knight, how handsome and how brave he was to have undertaken a journey to so remote a place as the Mount of Horai. Princess Moonlight took the branch in her hand and looked at it carefully. She then told her foster parents that she knew it was impossible for a man to have obtained a branch from the gold and silver tree growing on Mount Hore so quickly or so easily, and she was sorry to say she believed it artificial. The old man then went out to the expectant knight, who had now approached the house, and asked where he had found the branch. Then the man did not scruple to make up a long story. Two years ago, I took a ship and started in search of Mount Horai. After going before the wind for some time, I reached the far eastern sea. Then a great storm arose and I was tossed about for many days, losing all count of the points of the compass, and finally we were blown ashore on an unknown island. Here I found a place inhabited by demons who at one time threatened to kill and eat me. However, I managed to make friends with these horrible creatures, and they helped me and my sailors to repair the boats, and I set sail again. Our food gave out and we suffered much from sickness on board. At last, on the fifth hundred day from the day of starting, I saw far off on the horizon what looked like the peak of a mountain. On nearer approach this proved to be an island, in the center of which rose a high mountain. I landed and after wandering for about two or three days, I saw a shining being coming towards me on the, on the beach, holding in his hand a golden bowl. I went up to him and asked him if I had, by a good chance, found the island of Mount Horai, and he answered, Yes, this is Mount Horai. With much difficulty, I climbed to the summit. Here stood a golden tree, growing with silver roots in the ground. The wonders of that strange land are many, and if I began to tell you about them, I could never stop. In spite of my wish to stay there long, on breaking of the branch, I hurried back. With utmost speed, it has taken me 400 days to get back, and, as you see, my clothes are still damp from exposure on the long sea voyage. I have not even waited to change my clothes, so anxious was I to bring the branch to the princess quickly. Just at this moment, the six jewelers, who had been employed on the making of the branch, but not yet paid by the knight, arrived at the house and sent in a petition to the princess to be paid for the labor. They said that they had worked for over a thousand days making the branch of gold with its silver twigs and its jeweled fruits that was now presented to her by the knight, but as yet they had received nothing in payment. So the knight's deception was thus found out, and the princess, glad of an escape from one more importunate suitor, was only too pleased to send back the branch. She called in the workmen and had them paid liberally, and they went away happy. But on the way home, they were overtaken by the disappointed man, who beat them till they were nearly dead for letting out the secret, and they barely escaped with their lives. 
The knight then returned home, raging in his heart, and in despair of ever winning the princess, he gave up society and retired to a solitary life among the mountains. Now the third knight had a friend in China, so he wrote to him to get the skin of the fire red. The virtue of any part of this animal was that no fire could harm it. He promised his friend any amount of money he liked to ask if only he could get him the desired article. As soon as the news came that the ship on which his friend had sailed home had come into port, he rode seven days on horseback to meet him. He handed his friend a large sum of money and received the fire red skin. When he reached home, he put it carefully in a box and sent it to the princess while he waited outside for an answer. The bamboo cutter took the box from the knight and, as usual, carried it to her and tried to coax her to see the knight at once. But Princess Moonlight refused, saying that she must first put the skin to test by putting it into the fire. If it were the real thing, it would not burn. So she took off the crepe wrapper and opened the box, and then threw the skin into the fire. The skin crackled and burned up at once, and the princess knew that this man also had not fulfilled his words, so the third knight failed also. Now the fourth knight was no more enterprising than the rest. Instead of starting out on the quest of the dragon bearing on its head the five-colored radiating jewel, he called all his servants together and gave them the order to seek for it far and wide in Japan and in China, and he strictly forbade any of them to return till they had found it. His numerous retainers and servants started out in different directions, with no intention, however, of obeying what they considered an impossible order. They simply took a holiday, went to pleasant country places together, and grumbled at their master's unreasonableness. The knight, meanwhile, thinking that his retainers could not fail to find the jewel, repaired his house and fitted it up beautifully for the reception of the princess. He felt so sure of winning her. One year passed away in weary waiting, and still his man did not return with the dragon jewel. The knight became desperate. He could wait no longer, so taking with him only two men, he hired a ship and commanded the captain to go in search of the dragon. The captain and the sailors refused to undertake what they said was an absurd search, but the knight compelled him, at last, to put out to sea. When they had been but a few days out, they encountered a great storm, which lasted so long that by the time its fury abated, the knight had determined to give up the hunt of the dragon. They were at last blown on shore, for navigation was primitive in those days. Worn out with his travels and anxiety, the fourth suitor gave himself up to rest. He had caught a very heavy cold, and had to go to bed with a swollen face. The governor of the place, hearing of his plight, sent messengers with a letter inviting him to his house. While he was there thinking over all his troubles, his love for the princess turned to anger, and he blamed her for all the hardships he had undergone. He thought that it was quite probable she had wished to kill him so that she might be rid of him, and in order to carry out her wish, had sent him upon his impossible quest. At this point, all the servants he had sent out to find the jewel came to see him, and were surprised to find praise instead of displeasure awaiting them. Their master told them that he was hardly sick of adventure, and said that he never intended to go near the princess's house again in the future. Like all the rest, the fifth knight filled in his quest. He could not find the swallow's shell. By this time, the fame of Princess Moonlight's beauty had reached the heirs of the emperor, and he sent one of the court ladies to see if she really was as lovely as report said. If so, he would summon her to the palace and make her one of the ladies-in-waiting. When the court lady arrived, in spite of her father's entreaties, Princess Moonlight refused to see her. The imperial messenger insisted, seeing it was the emperor's order. Then Princess Moonlight told the old man that if she was forced to go to the palace in obedience to the emperor's order, she would vanish from the earth. When the emperor was told of her persistence in refusing to obey his summons, and that if pressed to obey she would disappear altogether from sight, he determined to go and see her. So he planned to go on a hunting excursion in the neighborhood of the bamboo cutter's house and see the princess himself. He sent words to the old man of his intention, 
and he received consent to the scheme. The next day the emperor set out with his retinue, which he soon managed to outright. He found the bamboo cutter's house and dismounted. He then entered the house and went straight to where the princess was sitting with her attendant maidens. Never had he seen anyone so wonderfully beautiful, and he could not but look at her, for she was more lovely than any human being, as she shone in her own soft radiance. When Princess Moonlight became aware that the stranger was looking at her, she tried to escape from the room, but the emperor caught her and begged her to listen to what he had to say. Her only answer was to hide her face in her sleeves. The emperor fell deeply in love with her and begged her to come to the court, where he could give her a position of honor and everything she could wish for. He was about to send for one of the imperial pelicans to take her back with him at once, saying that her grace and beauty should adorn a court and not be hidden in the bamboo cutter's cottage. But the princess stopped him. She said that if she were forced to go to the palace, she would turn at once into a shadow, and even as she spoke she began to lose her form. Her figure faded from his sight while he looked. The emperor then promised to leave her free if only she would resume her former shape, which she did. It was now time for him to return, for his retinue would be wondering what had happened to their royal master when they missed him for so long. So he bade her goodbye and left the house with a sad heart. Princess Moonlight was for him the most beautiful woman in the world. All others were dark beside her, and he thought of her day and night. His Majesty now spent much of his time in writing poems, telling her of his love and devotion, and sent them to her. And though she refused to see him again, she answered with many verses of her own, which told him gently and kindly that she could never marry any one of this earth. These little songs always gave him pleasure. At this time, her foster parents noticed that night after night the princess would sit on her balcony and gaze for hours at the moon in a spirit of deepest dejection, ending always in a burst of tears. One night the old man found her thus weeping, as if her heart were broken, and he besought her to tell him the reason of her sorrow. With many tears she told him that he had guessed rightly when he supposed her not to belong to this world, that she had in truth come from the moon, and that her time on earth would soon be over. On the fifteenth day of that very month of August, her friends from the moon would come to fetch her, and she would have to return. Her parents were both there, but having spent a lifetime on the earth, she had forgotten them, and also the moon world to which she belonged. It made her weep, she said, to think of leaving her kind foster parents and the home where she had been happy for so long. When her attendants heard this, they were very sad, and could not eat or drink for sadness at the thought that the princess was so soon to leave them. The emperor, as soon as the news was carried to him, sent messengers to the house to find out if the reports were true or not. The old bamboo cutter went out to meet the imperial messengers. The last few days of sorrow had been a heavy burden upon the old man. He had aged greatly and looked much more than his seventy years. Weeping bitterly, he told them that the report was only too true, but he intended, however, to make prisoners of the envoys from the moon and to do all he could to prevent the princess from being carried back. The man returned and told his majesty all that had passed. On the fifteenth day of that month, the emperor sent a guard of two thousand warriors to watch the house. One thousand stationed themselves on the roof, another thousand kept watch round all the entrances of the house. All were well-trained archers with bows and arrows. The bamboo cutter and his wife hid Princess Moonlight in an inner room. Then the old man gave orders that no one was to sleep that night. All in the house were to keep a strict watch and be ready to protect the princess. With these precautions and the help of the emperor's men at arms, he hoped to withstand the moon messengers. But the princess told him that all these measures to keep her would be useless and that when her people came for her, nothing whatever could prevent them from carrying out their purpose. Even the emperor's men would be powerless. Then she added with tears that she was very, very sorry to leave him and his wife, whom she had learned to love as her parents, 
and that if she could do as she liked, she would stay with them in their old age and try to make some time to return for all the love and kindness they had showered upon her during all her earthly life. The night wore on. The yellow harvest moon rose high in the heavens, flooding the world asleep with her golden light. Silence reigned over the pine and the bamboo forest, and on the roof where the thousand men at arms waited. Then the night grew great towards the dawn, and all hopes that the danger was over, that Princess Moonlight would not have to leave them after all. Then suddenly, the watchers saw a cloud form around the moon, and while they looked, this cloud began to roll earthwards. Nearer and nearer it came, and everyone saw, with dismay, that its course lay towards the house. In a short time, the sky was entirely obscured, till at last the cloud lay over the dwelling only ten feet off the ground. In the midst of the cloud there stood a flying chariot, and in the chariot a band of luminous beings. One amongst them, who looked like a king and appeared to be the chief, stepped out of the chariot and, poised in the air, called to the old man to come out. The time has come, he said, for Princess Moonlight to return to the moon from when she came. She committed a grave fault and as punishment was sent to live down here for a time. We know what good care you have taken of the princess and we have rewarded you for this and have sent you wealth and prosperity. We put the gold and the bamboos for you to find. I have brought up this princess for twenty years and never once has she done a wrong thing. Therefore the princess you are seeking cannot be this one, said the old man. I pray you to look elsewhere. Then the messenger called aloud, saying, Princess Moonlight, come out from this lowly dwelling. Rest not here another moment. At these words, the screens of the princess's room slid open of their own accords, revealing the princess shining in her own radiance, bright and wonderful and full of beauty. The messenger led her forth and placed her in the chariot. She looked back and saw with pity the deep sorrow of the old man. She spoke to him many comforting words and told him that it was not her will to leave him and that he must always think of her when looking at the moon. The bamboo cutter implored to be allowed to accompany her, but this was not allowed. The princess took off her embroidered outer garment and gave it to him as a keepsake. One of the moon beings in the chariot held a wonderful coat of wings. Another one had a phial full of elixir of life, which was given to the princess to drink. She swallowed a little and was about to give the rest to the old man, but she was prevented from doing so. The robe of wings was about to be put upon her shoulders, but she said, Wait a little, I must not forget my good friend the emperor. I must write him once more to say goodbye, while still in this human form. In spite of the impatience of the messengers and charioteers, she kept them waiting while she wrote. She placed a file of the elixir of life with the letter, and giving them to the old man, she asked him to deliver them to the emperor. Then the chariot began to roll heavenwards, towards the moon, and as they all gazed with tearful eyes at the receding princess, the dawn broke, and in the rosy light of the day, the moon chariot and all in it were lost amongst the fleecy clouds. Princess Moonlight's letter was carried to the palace. His Majesty was afraid to touch the elixir of life, so he sent it with the letter to the top of the most sacred mountain in the land, Mount Fuji, and there the royal emissaries burned it on the summit at sunrise. So to this day, people say there is smoke to be seen rising from the top of Mount Fuji to the clouds. The End As we have now come to the end of this story, please let us know if you've enjoyed this podcast and if you would like to see a continuation of the Japanese folk tales.